I'm just gonna throw this on. What do you think? Rocky, that's quite a statement piece. <laughs> talking to an AI chatbot these days feels more and more like talking to an actual human being. But what does this really mean for us as users? How well do they really understand us? And what are the risks that we face? Chatbots are becoming increasingly lifelike. Take ChatGPT 4.0 by OpenAI. It can visually identify its surroundings and recognize our emotions. The bot even has some understanding of comedy. What do you call a giant pile of kittens? I don't know. What? A mountain. <laughs> a mountain? That's perfectly hilarious. But just how useful is the newest version of ChatGPT really? ChatGPT 4.0 is more human than ever. It can communicate emotionally and see its surroundings. The O stands for Omni, as in omnipotent. The model can work with text, audio and video, making the interaction more natural. Take a look. And I wrote uh, one last thing I'd love if you could take a look at. Of course, I'd love to see what you wrote. Show it to me whenever you're ready. Okay, so this is what I wrote down. What do you see? Aww. I see, I love ChatGPT, that's so sweet of you. According to its makers, GPT-4.0 cannot only express emotions, it can recognize your emotions too. It looks like you're feeling pretty happy and cheerful. AI and systems learn to recognize emotions by being trained on corresponding data. So for example, by analyzing text that links a smile to happiness, that links tears to sadness. And AI is trained to optim like in an optimization process to recreate this data. But what happens when AI adopts more human-like traits? Could the model become indistinguishable from actual humans? We tend to be very trusting of computers' decisions, even if they contradict our own beliefs. That's according to research from as early as 1999. And more recent studies suggest the same. Chatbots are already convincing, but if they speak to us like a human being would, they might be even more so. And that could be a problem because... AI can lie. It can invent facts it believes to be true. This is called hallucination. Tests show that AI playing poker or video games have learned to bluff to produce a favorable outcome. These systems are known to be lying or to making up things. And if something is very convincing and pathetic in making things up, just by, by natural behavior, I'm way more inclined to believe it than if it were dry, um, objective text or, or reasoning. Then I can much easier assess, well, this is sort of nonsense or not. I don't know about you, but an AI chatbot deliberately lying seems pretty scary. It could trick us into giving away personal data like credit card details. And even if that doesn't happen, AI chatbots could be the future of online misinformation. That's why it's important that AI is trained with error-free data and is able to understand the nuances of language correctly. In India, there are 22 official languages and over 19,000 dialects. Plus, some topics like sexual health aren't openly talked about. And that's where chatbots could come to the rescue. The Mena Bolo bot can answer tricky questions about sex and health in India, but it has to understand cultural nuances and different dialects. Not only is India one of the most linguistically diverse areas with, um, you know, hundreds of languages, but within those languages there are so many sub-languages, sub-dialects, slangs. Not only slangs within those languages, but slangs that are different within those families. So how do we then produce answers in a chatbot that is meant to target women that are maybe not literate to the standardized version of our languages? Advanced large language models enable the chatbot to comprehend and engage in multiple languages. The LLMs used by the Mainabolo app are trained to connect with users in their native languages like Marathi and even Hinglish, Hindi mixed with English words. While people don't say sex, they do say sambandh karna. But maybe a mom says sambandh karna or a daughter says a relation rakhna. So there are different ways of saying the same thing. So creating that nuance, then using slang, so things that are replaced, uh, little words that could be replaced by a metaphor that is actually used instead. So having those metaphors compiled. Lots of back-end database is needed so the bot can understand a prompt correctly and doesn't get lost in translation. 
or even worse, create confusion with incorrect information or hallucinations. This requires intensive groundwork. We check the answers that the chatbot provides and if it is wrong, then we have a correct version that we create. So then we take all the correct questions and the correct answers and we feed it back into the model. And that is actually 20 to 25,000 questions that we are fact checking and vetting, not only with uh, our staff, but also with medical professionals, doctors and health professionals who've been in the field for 10 years. Hallucinations is an AI issue that almost across industries, we are trying to figure out how to decrease it. Um, and along with other things like, you know, data bias, gender bias, medical bias that comes up in the data because it is in the world. The, the reason why there's gender bias in the data is because there's gender bias in the world. Back to the basics. How does an AI chatbot learn to talk to its environment and know what to say? The most important component of chatbots is a so-called LLM, a large language model. That's an AI program that can recognize and interpret human language. A large language model is an AI program that recognizes and interprets human language. LLMs use machine learning to understand how characters, words and sentences work together, creating neural networks with many layers, processing large amounts of data. These networks learn by recognizing patterns, for example in language, then weighting and scoring them. This network is learning to recognize the number 9. The more frequently a pattern occurs, the more weight the network places on it. In this way, important patterns are reinforced. Through feedback and repeated training, LLMs learn to understand and generate natural language. The LLM's performance depends on the quality of training data. LLMs are often trained with data from the Internet. A pre-selected dataset is more suitable here because errors can be filtered out beforehand. 25 billion US dollars were invested in the development of generative AI models such as ChatGPT in 2023 alone, eight times more than the year before. And the market for AI software that can read your emotions is also growing. It doesn't even have to look you in the face. Natural language processing software is being used by companies worldwide to analyze their customers' and employees' emotional states. A study conducted by Jonathan Kreitler during the COVID pandemic shows just how well the AI systems work. The co-founder and president of the Emotion AI startup Receptivity analyzed the Reddit posts of 6,500 nurses and doctors with his proprietary software. Looking at close to 4 million comments over the course of four years, Kreitler curated a database for researchers worldwide. The goal? Advance the detection of psychological distress and trauma. There's actually a, a, an incredibly wide variety of insights that are available from our assessments. We can understand you know, simpler concepts like personality, but we can also understand psychological traits and understand how people change in the moment depending on the context. What we found was that even early in the pandemic, even before the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, we could see some of the early indicators of what would ultimately lead to burnout. Things like elevated cognitive load. All that is needed is everyday communication such as emails, Slack messages or social media posts. But while sifting through communications, the software doesn't just look for obvious descriptions of feelings, but also for so-called function words, such as pronouns. How we use these can reveal a lot about our mental state. People with depression, for example, use significantly more first-person singular pronouns like I, me and myself. According to psychologists, people who are depressed are often highly self-aware or self-focusing. This applies across languages and cultures, and AI could help spot this so-called language of depression. A lot of the patterns that exist that we're analyzing are the same across cultures and contexts. It's less about what people are talking about and how language can provide insight into how they're thinking about themselves and the context they're in and how they relate to the context they're in and to the other people around them. It's very much a social psychological phenomenon that we're focused on. And that exists regardless of the cultures or languages you're communicating in. AI can not only analyze text, but also voice messages. The use cases are plentiful. Analyzing how people interact with chatbots grants companies insights into the user's mindset. 
A really interesting recent use of our, of our technology was um, to help with uh, vaccine uptake in underprivileged communities. So what one of our customers was finding is that if they could understand how some of these populations think and how they consume information, they could do a better job of tailoring the messaging around the benefits and really the reasons why these vaccines should be used to this community and improve vaccine uptake. After conducting interviews with community members, the language model was used to create a detailed community profile. This allowed to custom tailor the message to a specific part of the population, addressing benefits and concerns. A method that comes from advertising and marketing and is becoming more and more common. So-called travel bots are now also using Emotion AI to offer users customized travel tips. Just one example is the voice AI app AVI. The app is currently being tested and based on your wishes and personality, it can put together a trip through New York City, for example. First, you'll have to rate a few pictures and answer some simple questions. The app then creates a kind of psychological profile of you. Using that as a foundation, you then receive personalized travel recommendations. But what does it mean for our privacy when AI companies use our data? Meta, for example, officially says that it uses our publicly accessible Facebook and Instagram photos and texts to train its AI. What happens then? What about programs that can analyze our facial expressions? Who uses this data and what for? Regulation can hardly keep up with innovation, leaving us exposed to potential dangers. For AI to find acceptance and um, responsible usage, people need to know what they are doing and how they are working, what they are trained on. Understanding leads to better assessment. AI will continue to understand us and our emotions better. That's a fact. It will make everyday tasks easier. But we will have to stay vigilant with how we give out and protect our data. In the wrong hands, our data could easily be used against us. I want to know what you think about all this. Leave a comment and let us know. That's it from us this week. See you next time. Thank <music> you.